This is a group within the Energy Analysis Department, within the Environmental Energy Technologies Division. I want to start by introducing you to our group. Uh, the group was founded in 1988, so we've been working in China for over 20 years. It was founded by Mark Levine, who I think I saw come in. Mark, there he is. <laughs> and um, we are focused on uh, research related to end-use energy efficiency. So we're not really focused on the supply side, all these numbers of the rapid um, growth you hear in electricity production, et cetera. We're focused on technologies, policies, and programs to address the building's energy efficiency, industrial energy efficiency, and to a lot lesser extent, uh, transportation, <coughs> those sectors of the economy. This graph shows the areas that we work in, and our mode of working is to look for best practices wherever they are. We look in California, we look in the US, we look around the world, and we draw from those best practices and take that information to China and work with Chinese colleagues to adapt uh, those best practices to sit the situation in China. We've worked in, to transfer the, the research work done in the energy analysis department related to appliance standards and efficiency labels to, to China. We've transferred that knowledge, that information, brought Chinese here, taken groups there. We've worked uh, also to establish building efficiency standards in China based on work done in our division. In the industrial sector, which is the area I'll focus mostly on today, we have looked around the world at other um, uh, policies and programs that have worked, been successful, and transferred those to the Chinese. We've also do a, some modeling and scenario work, uh, looking out into the future, projections for China's energy use and CO2 emissions. And we do policy analysis. We uh, evaluate the impact of the different policies and programs that are being undertaken <coughs> in China. We have about 40 current projects in China right now among uh, all the different members of our group. And we collaborate with around 50 different institutions in China. This is the group. Uh, many of them are here. You guys want to raise your hands? All the different members. Yeah, I see all you guys back there. So the China group. Uh, the top row is kind of our full-time staff. Uh, we have one more we need to add the picture next week. We're growing. And the bottom row, uh, these are our postdocs, visiting researchers, uh, visiting faculty members. We have an exchange program with China where we bring people to uh, LBL. We work with them. We learn from them. They learn from us. And then they go back to China. And then we have uh, good relations with people back there. So those of you who saw the talk yesterday, you saw the different pieces of the carbon, um, uh, the carbon cycle two initiative that were explained. We're focusing here on energy analysis, obviously in the developing world, and on energy efficiency. So that's the piece of the puzzle that we're that I'm talking about today. For my talk, I'm going to give you historical information about China's energy use and CO2 emissions and give you some background information on what's going on in terms of energy intensity trends and the policies that are in place in China right now. Then I'm going to focus on industrial energy efficiency. I've been working in this area in China for about 10 years now. And we've done work both on the policy side. As Ashok was saying, you have to have the policies in place to um, engender the uptake of energy efficiency. We've also been working on the technology side. So we've done some capacity building and analysis and technology. Then I'll tell you where things are today with China and make some links with the Carbon Cycle Initiative. So starting with the big picture of the historical energy use, this graph shows uh, primary energy use the units that you see are million tons of coal equivalent. That's a Chinese unit. But if you're used to either quads or exajoules, just remember the US is about 100 quads and exajoules. So you can scale down from there. What I'd like you to note is uh, the rapid growth in energy use in China over the last uh, 20, 25 years, especially this large bump up in around 2002. I've also divided this graph into the uh, different economic sectors. And you see commercial and residential buildings on the top, then transportation, and finally, industry. In China, industry is responsible for about 2 thirds of the energy use there. 
so it's really different than industrialized countries, and it's an important sector to focus on. Within this uh, two-thirds, about 80% are energy-intensive industries. So we're talking about steel and cement and aluminum and glass and all these really heavy indus industries. Now, because China's uh, power uh, supply or energy supply is more coal-based than the United States, where about 70% of China's power comes from coal, whereas, uh, oh, thanks, whereas it's more around 25% in the United States, this chart looks different when you plot CO2 emissions. And in fact, China surpassed the United States in energy-related CO2 emissions around 2006, 2007. So what is driving this demand? I'm Ashok alluded to some of these uh, drivers. In China, it's population growth. That won't peak until about 2030. And that population is rapidly urbanizing. It's, uh, people are moving from rural areas to, uh, to urban areas. You can see from this chart, currently it's under 50% urbanized in China. By 2025, it'll be 65%. By 2050, maybe around 80%. The US is at 80% right now. So there's really a mass migration from the rural areas to the urban areas. You can see 290 million uh, uh, residents moved into urban areas between 1990 and now, that's the population of the US, you know, becoming urbanized. And even more are expected to move to cities uh, between now and 2025. All these folks need housing. They need all the other infrastructure that goes along with that, hospitals, schools, government buildings, all the roads. So China is, of course, the world's largest producer of many of these commodities now. China produces over 500 million tons of steel, the next largest producer is Japan at 120 million tons, and the US produces 92 million tons. China is also the world's largest producer of cement at 1.4 billion tons. India is the next largest producer at 175, and the US produces about 90 million tons. So it's just scales that, you know, it's really difficult for us to even think in, ter in these terms. Once these folks have their housing, they move into the housing, they start to buy equipment that they didn't have in the rural area either. So here is a chart showing the saturation levels. Basically, what it shows is that for every household, there's on average now in China 1.3 televisions. <coughs> every household has a clothes washer, every household has a refrigerator, and 80% of them have air conditioning. So these are all energy consuming equipment and equal amount of equipment is going into commercial buildings. So if we step back and look at the energy use per GDP, a metric that Ashok also introduced earlier, uh, what have been the trends in China and where are things going? Well, interestingly, between 1980 and 2002, China was able to reduce the amount of energy it needed to produce an economic unit, uh, unit of GDP, by about 5% per year on average during this time period. Now, China had a official policy between 1980 and 2000 to quadruple GDP and only double energy use. It was a social development goal. They wanted to bring people out of poverty, but they didn't want to use a lot of energy to do that. Energy is expensive, it's polluting, and it's actually um, becoming uh, more scarce, uh, some energy sources. So the focus was on reducing the energy use. And they had very strong efficiency policies in the 1980s. They had a network of energy efficiency centers around the country. They imposed quotas on energy use on the industries. They offered financing, technology assistance. And it was really quite a large energy efficiency infrastructure. This became um, weakened in the 1990s as China tried to move away from a kind of heavy-handed regulation to a more market-based economy. And we also saw earlier that around 1995, there became this more rapid uptick in the urbanization. So those two trends started to weaken um, this relationship in the later 1990s. And in 2001, China joined the WTO, started manufacturing a lot of goods for the rest of the world. It was kind of a convergence of all these different uh, things happening. And what happened? Well, the energy intensity increased on average 5% per year from 2002 to 2005. This really shocked the government because they had another policy to quadruple GDP from 2000 to 2020 and only double energy use. 
uh, as they had done before, and this wasn't going to happen uh, given this trend. So the government <clears throat> at the highest level announced an efficiency target to reduce energy per unit of GDP by 20 percent between 2005 and 2010. This target, the 20 percent is the national target. They then assigned the same target to every province. It, was, it varied from like 18 to 22, but basically the provinces each got their target. And everyone is responsible for meeting the target in 2010. And promotions and awards and all these other mechanisms have been put in place. Uh, and and they're, um, they won't be awarded or given promotions if their province doesn't meet its target. So during the time when the energy intensity was going up, we were asked to uh, assist China in how to stimulate energy efficiency improvement in the industrial sector. What kind of policies and programs were other countries using? Here they were having this, this problem, and what could they do? We took a global survey. We looked around the world in many different countries, pulled together <coughs> some uh, materials. We made presentations, had workshops in China with a number of experts there um, to expose them to what was happening in other countries. They chose to look further at something called negotiated agreements. These are agreements that were in place in Europe, Japan, Australia, a number of other countries at the time, where industries negotiate with government in order to set a long-term efficiency or carbon dioxide emissions reduction goal. They're typically a five or a 10-year reduction goal so that industry has time to figure out how to get there and make a plan. And the government then provides support, technical support, sometimes financial support, to assist the industry in reaching this goal. Um, the Chinese decided to try a policy pilot program uh, using this goal, this, uh, this policy. And they set it up with two steel mills in Shandong province. We provided technical assistance. We have information about steel production and energy efficiency measures in, in the steel industry. So we helped the um, the plants determine what kind of actions they could take. And they set a goal for 2005. It was just a two-year pilot. They went ahead and signed a contract between the two uh, steel mills and the government. And in fact, the plants did implement a number of efficiency measures, undertook a lot of energy management, and installed um, protocols for reporting. And this program was considered a success and a model for a national program. At the time that the government announced the 20% overall energy intensity target, they also announced a program called the Top 1000 Energy Consuming Energy Enterprises Program. And this program is based on the pilot of signing these energy saving agreements, but this time with the 1,000 largest enterprises in China. These 1,000 enterprises are about half of the industrial use and a third of all of China's use. So it's really a key target group to go after. The government defined these targets. They signed contracts with the, the um, provincial governments, who then signed the contracts with each of the um, enterprises in their province. And they were required to track and supervise and monitor these uh, enterprises. The enterprises undertook obligations also. They had to do an energy audit. They had to benchmark themselves. They had to do an action plan. How were they going to meet their target? And report uh, back to the government on where they were and what their problems were. And we've provided technical assistance for this program in a number of different areas. But I'm going to give you some examples of the assist assistance we've been providing for the cement industry. As you remember, the cement industry, you know, China's got 1.4 billion tons. So we thought we'd focus on this industry. I'm going to assume most of you haven't been to a cement plant and don't know how cement is manufactured. So I'll give you a quick little tutorial. Uh, you can break it into three main steps. Raw materials preparation, you got to go to the quarry, get your limestone, grind it up. Then you mix it with some other things, and you have what's called the raw meal. You then uh, take coal, in the case of China, and put it in a kiln, heat it to about 1,500 C with uh, all these materials, and you spit out this um, material called clinker. You then grind up the clinker uh, with other additives, and you have cement. It's a pretty simple process. What's interesting to us is the, that this process uh, has energy-related CO2 emissions. All the electricity or the bulk of the electricity in China is uh, from coal. And all the um, fuels in the kiln are all coal. 
And so there's lots of CO2 emitted in that manner. But it also there's process-related emissions for cement manufacturing. The limestone, which is calcium carbonate, when it is heated up, it goes through a calcination process. It releases CO2, and then lime is what's left. And so you have this kind of double um, effect with the cement industry. Roughly one ton of CO2 is produced for every ton of cement, and it's roughly half between process and energy related. So unlike other industries, you have a doubling effect with the cement industry. <clears throat> so we, we set out to identify technologies and measures that could be applied, energy efficiency measures, in the cement industry. We we're very fortunate the colleagues in our department are doing this research for the US Department, uh, US Energy Environmental Protection Agency. EPA has a Energy Star program for industry. Most of you know the little Energy Star logo that's on your computer or, or other pieces of equipment. They have a similar program for industry where they go and they provide support around energy efficiency for different industries. And they happen to have asked LBL to do a guidebook to identify all these different technologies and measures for the cement industry. So we characterize those measures and um, what this does is it, it puts everything on a level playing field. There's lots of information out there, but most people don't have it in one handbook. And they don't have it so that it's all in the same units per ton of cement and, and the same economic units. So it's, it's a guidebook now with about 50 different technologies and measures in it that can be handed out. We translated the units, we translated the language, and we also added some Chinese case studies, and we have it for distribution in China. Once you've identified all these different technologies and measures, you can use it uh, for other means. And we've used it to develop energy conservation supply curves and a benchmarking tool to help the user understand which measures they should choose among these 50. So energy conservation supply curves were developed in EETD by uh, Alan, uh, Alan Meyer and Art Rosenfeld in the 1980s. And they've been used a lot in our um, division, looking at buildings efficiency and uh, industrial efficiency. Re most recently, McKinsey and Company has been releasing a lot of these uh, different supply curves, but they, they were started here. And um, we did a study. We were asked by the World Bank to look at more efficient plants in Shandong province, 16 of these plants, and see if they had any more potential. You know, they were just recently built, and was there anything that could be done? And so we narrowed our, our um, number down to 34 uh, different energy efficiency technologies and measures and did both an electricity and a fuel supply curve. I'll just show you the electricity curve here. What a conservation supply curve does is it helps you rank your measures in terms of um, which ones have a better um, efficiency, uh, cost efficiency. So on the cost of conserved electricity side, what you have is your annualized capital cost plus your operation maintenance cost divided by your energy savings so that you can compare it to the price of electricity. So this takes each of these 34 measures and makes a step ladder up showing you not only their electricity savings potential but their costs. And it compares it to the cost of electricity that these plants faced in 2008. This unit when converted uh, to uh, US units is 8 cents per kilowatt hour. That's roughly the same as most industries face in China. It's a little bit higher, actually, in Shandong province. And in the United States, the average cost per kilowatt hour for electricity that industry faces is seven cents. So it's a little bit higher than what uh, US industry is, um, is paying for electricity. So the total cost effective, everything that falls below this curve that we identified was about, if I remember correctly, 16% of the electricity that was being used by these plants. And if they put everything in, regardless of the cost, they could save 40%. And on the fuel side, our numbers were closer to 8 to 10% uh, efficiency potential. Another analysis tool that we developed using all this information about efficiency measures is called the Benchmarking and Energy Saving Tool for the cement sector. We worked in collaboration with a number of Chinese organizations to develop this tool. And what it does is it benchmarks a cement plant to both world and Chinese best practice. We took those three different steps that I showed you for cement making and actually broke it down into many more. It's about 12 steps. For each of those steps, we identified the best practice energy use from somewhere around the world, some commercially operating plant, both in China and worldwide. And then we constructed a model so that when we visit a plant, we put in their data but then we model it as though they are using best practice and identify the gaps for them. 
They see the big gap, and then they see where within their processes they have uh, room to improve. Then <clears throat> there's our 50 men, uh, measures again from our guidebook. We put those into the tool, and we have an interactive feature there that I actually like better than the supply curve because you can make packages. And some of these plants are top 1,000 plants. They have a target for 2010 of energy savings. So they can package these measures in different ways. They can be watching what the capital costs are while are they meeting their energy target or CO2 target, et cetera. So they, it's an interactive tool, and they play with the different uh, available efficiency measures. So <clears throat> excuse me, we beta tested this tool with two cement plants in April of 2008. Then we went around and did uh, two-day trainings with um, about 300 cement plant staff in four different provinces in China. And now we're in a new project funded by uh, the Department of State through the Asia Pacific Partnership, where we've combined our tool with a tool that came out of DOE that looks just at the combustion efficiency in the kiln, which is you know, a, a very key area of energy use. And we also combined it with the World Resources Institute, World Business Council for Sustainable Development tool, which leaves them with the carbon footprint of their plant. So it's got the, they have the whole picture now. Uh, we decided instead of running around to four different provinces like we did before, or many different provinces, that we would train Chinese trainers. So we had a one-week training this summer. And this is the, the group who got their training certificates. And now we're in the process of doing an energy audit for 42 plants, on-site audits. We took this group of trained trainers to three different plants uh, this fall and so that they could have the on-site experience where there's lots of data issues and go through and, and train them how to use all three tools there. So we're in the midst of this, uh, this project, but we will be doing follow-up on selected number of these plants and go back and find out uh, what kind of uptake they had and what barriers they faced in terms of uh, which, which efficiency measures they did or didn't um, adopt. So what's the current situation now in China? I mentioned that they, there was this 20% target that uh, was announced in 2005 for achievement by 2010. China put a lot of programs into place in support of this target. They've been ramping up since about 2006. The Top 1000 program I already introduced to you. It's a program we've been helping with. The goal for that was to save 100 million tons of coal equivalent by 2010. They just announced that in the end of 2009, they already met that goal. That translates to about 250 million tons of CO2, uh, which is roughly the same emission, annual emissions of Poland. So it's been really quite a savings. And I assume that they will, uh, you know, they'll be continuing. So that, that project will surpass its goal. There's other projects up here on the chart. We've been kind of following how they're working. We're working with the Buildings Energy Efficiency Project. Mark Levine has uh, projects in that area. We're working in the appliance standards area. David Fridley and others are supporting those efforts. Uh, and overall, our analysis, which I, I cited here, show that most of these programs are on track to meet their goals. So where does that leave things? You remember the uh, average annual decline of 5% and the kind of shocking increase. Well, then the 20% target was announced. These programs were put into place. And China has been able to turn this curve down, 1.8% the first year, 4% the second year. And the latest numbers are 5.2% uh, this last year. And from our analysis and from other you know, reports, it looks as though China is on track to achieve this 20% goal in 2010. So linking this to the carbon cycle initiative, uh, I just wanted to reiterate that China is a place to try things. The government is interested in doing policy-related pilots, technology pilots. As you saw, we tried something and it, it you know, blossomed into this 1,000 enter enterprise program. I'm talking with people in the Heat Islands uh, work, and also we're looking at starting a data center's uh, efficiency uh, initiative in China. There's lots of room for experimentation and trying things. And China has a huge scale-up potential. You know, obviously, anything that starts small there can scale big, because China's so big. And pretty much all of these areas are uh, of significant interest um, in China. Um, especially areas like uh, carbon capture and sequestration. China already has some demonstration projects, both pre- and post-combustion CCS. So 
there's definitely uh, interest there. And so if anyone in the division and throughout the lab have ideas, please come talk to us and you know, we'll see if there's any opportunities. So with that, I'll leave you with some websites to check for some further information and of course acknowledge our funders. Thank you. So Ashok, do you want me to take questions? It looks like I have a little bit of time. Yes, we just show us a futuristic slide. <laughs> All right, Shook didn't want me to end on such a good note. <laughs> so um, despite the fact that we are re going to reach this 20% target, um, others in our group, I'm not one of the modelers that does this, uh, this work, have looked at two different scenarios for China's overall emissions. And so you see the dashed line is kind of where we are now. This is the continual improvement scenario. So that's kind of you know, what we're already seeing happening in China. And this is an accelerated improvement scenario where um, energy efficiency is accelerated in all sectors. And we have more renewables, more nuclear. The thing that's not in the second uh, graph is CCS. So there is room for uh, improvement, assuming CCS works. And so it's um, while emissions will peak and begin to come down by 2050, it really isn't what's needed for yet for the, any of the goals that you hear out there, 80% below by 2050, 2 degrees, or 350, 450 ppm. We're not on any of those trajectories yet in China. So we need more people to come help push, push things uh, faster in China. Okay. So you got your negative side too, Ashok. <laughs> Reality, yes. Alan? What causes the inflection around, 20, uh, around 2020? Uh, well, there's a few different things. I might turn to the modelers, but um, population growth does peak in 2030, so that helps. And um, urbanization rates may be slowing down a little bit, so those were some of our key drivers. Uh, David, you want to add anything more in terms of why, why does it flatten out? I would just say that it, it reflects what we see as a number of, of trends towards saturation. That's uh, right. A, a, a number of trends towards saturation. In other words, there's only going to be so many square meters per employee in the tertiary sector. There's only going to be so much nitrogenous fertilizer applied per hectare of land. Uh, the road building boom is slowing down. The railroad boom is slowing down. Uh, and, and all of these kind of saturation trends lead, lead primarily to a moderation of industrial output. Uh, you don't see that same kind of moderation in the other sectors. Yes, this is energy-related CO2, and so we know this number pretty well. Uh, and it's, you know, the energy, to the extent that you um, believe or trust the energy numbers, this is just a conversion factor to get the CO2 here. Uh, there are questions about the energy numbers. If you take all the provincial energy statistics and add them, they total more than the national total that's given by China. So there's lots of data issues, but basically it's, it's pretty much a given. Regarding the others, China's in the process of doing a new greenhouse gas inventory, and uh, they did one in the 1990s, and they're doing another one under the UN <laughs> FCCC framework, and it should be out in about a year. So hopefully all the other, um, at least the Kyoto gases will be in there, and I don't know about others. China is moving away from coal as, um, as possible. They just, uh, January 31st, so I guess that was Sunday, 
provided their goals under the Copenhagen Accord. And one of those goals is to um, have non-fossil sources reach 15% by 2020. So that's, it's, yeah, it's moving in the right direction. But, you know, there's a lot of coal available in China. It's cheap, and there's a lot of development issues. So it is a tough question. It's a very hard question to face in that situation. We, we also work with the Chinese on renewable energy policy in our division and have a whole set of activities that try to accelerate the deployment of renewables. Okay, how's, how are we doing yeah, on time? No, do you have any hope for these like green cements? I think what I thought I had, there's a company out on the coast of California that they're working on developing green cement. The question is, uh, do we have any hope for green cement? Um, there have been companies trying to develop non-CO2 or low CO2 cement for many, many years. We are watching these developments. Nothing is on the market yet. Nothing's scalable yet. There's other things that can be done uh, in the cement industry to significantly improve uh, or reduce the CO2 emissions right now that aren't being done in China. So we're pushing for those commercialized technologies, but always keeping our eye out for new ones. Well, I think the trend is generally uh, reflecting of the legal migration, but of course there is undocumented illegal migration. But these are coming out of these are statistics coming out of the UN, so it's it's reflecting UN estimates of you know the the people in the cities. I'm not sure if what their you know status is. And we have to thank you now for paying attention, and um, we'll turn it over to Marianne. Thanks. <laughs>